Welcome, everybody. If you'd like to please rise as you are willing and able and join us in our spirit music. Number 346 in the Bloom Hymnal, Come Sing a Song With Me. Today we have opening words from Mr. Paul Bailey, just a short introduction here. Paul is a longtime member of UUCF, he loves giving talks, also enjo enjoys the daytimers group here at UUCF. Paul is a Chrysler retiree and lives in Garden City with his wife Nancy and five cats. Dr. Joseph Warrington, the Quaker doctor practicing in Philadelphia, told Elizabeth Blackwell that it is of no use trying. Thee cannot gain admission to medical school. Elizabeth told Dr. Warrington that if the path of duty led me to hell, I would go there, and I did not think that by being with devils, I should become a devil myself. Also, a strong idea, long cherished, till it has taken deep root in the soul and become an all-absorbing duty cannot thus be laid aside. I must accomplish my end, and I consider being a doctor the noblest and most useful path that I can tread, and if one country rejects me, I will go to another. And we light this chalice, symbolic of the warmth of community and the brightness that love brings to the world, illuminating our search for justice and peace. Light, the force that nurtures all living things here in our midst, in this flame, so tiny and so significant. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Universalist Unitarian Church of Farmington. My name is Mark Petrie, and I am the chair of the fundraising committee here at UUCF. 
Our minister, Reverend Leonetta, is out of the pulpit today. As I mentioned, we have Mr. Paul Bailey to today as a guest speaker. I'd like to extend a special welcome to any visitors today. Please join us in the lower level after service for coffee hour. We'd like to meet you. Uh, newcomers may enjoy introductory conversations downstairs at the welcome table with our members. In fact, I'd invite uh, any first-time visitors just to go ahead and stand and let us know where you're from and how you heard about us. Uh, we would like to meet you. Anybody here that's new today? Yes, ma'am. Oh, terrific. <laughs> the Hyster Hysterical Society, is that what it is called? Oh. <laughs> terrific. That's us. <laughs> we do get pretty hysterical sometimes, that's great. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time and talent. It's appreciated. Thank you. Very good. Uh, also, during the service, we have supervised nursery for babies and toddlers and religious education classes for children and youth. Please see our religious education coordinator, Natalie Dargatz, for more information. Should you need to leave the service for any reason, there are two other locations in the building where the service is broadcast. An usher can direct you to where you need to go. Our UU principles begin with our pledge to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of all people. As we are a welcoming congregation, we welcome into our community people of all races, sexual orientations, belief systems, and ages, including any who are fidgety and create youthful noises. These little humans represent our future, and we welcome them fully in our meeting house, which is fortunate for me because I have two of them. <laughs> Uh, let's see, uh, announcements. I know we have one from Social Justice. Yes, there she is. Oh, two. <laughs> Got a lot of Social Justice going on here. <laughs> well, my name is Ma, and I'm from Social Justice. And I just wanted to uh, let people know that there's a Save the World meeting tonight at 7 o'clock um, in the Marge Brown Room. And that the speaker is going to be somebody who um, can train people on how to register people to vote. As you may be aware, in the last election, uh, people can register to, be, register to vote absentee, no reason. And he'll train us on, on, on also assisting people in getting on the absentee list. So anyways, his name's Scott Riley, and he's with a ACLU People Power, and he's going to train us how to get people out to vote and how to register people to vote. Anyways, just wanted to let you know. Thank you. Gloria Tweedy, Social Justice. Remem I, you, if you don't remember, I'm reminding you. Page 6 tells you how you can sign up for Gleaners on March 21st. Other information there also. If you have difficulties, which I did, signing up online, there's, get to me, all the information is here. It's from 9 to 12, Saturday, March 21st. Thank you. Yeah, Libby? Hi, I'm Libby Berger. Um, also on social justice, but this is more RE-based than social justice. The quilt that you've been hearing about, we hope to do the final put together of the, of the blocks um, next Sunday downstairs. If you would like to be part of that, particularly if you have a sewing machine, bring you, you and your sewing machine, 
Um, but you can also just help us pin and organize and all that kind of stuff. So that'll be after the service downstairs. And the other thing is that I am so excited to hear what Paul has to say about Elizabeth Blackwell because she's been so one of my heroes since I was about 10. Excellent. Thank you, Libby. So please rise as you are willing and able for our next hymn, number 118 in the blue hymnal, please. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Building up a world, I'm going to let it shine. Building up a world, I'm going to let it shine. Building up a world, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Paul says he can't sing. Come on, Paul. That was great. That's terrific. All right. <laughs> Please join me in reading our litany of gathering in your order of service. We have a great deal more kindness than is ever spoken. How many persons we meet in houses whom we scarcely speak to, whom yet we honor, and who honor us? Read the language of these wandering eye beams. The heart knoweth. A perfect heart is one that has known love and loss, joy and sorrow. The perfect heart is one that has been shared. We'd like to invite you to share your first name in a joy or a sorrow at the microphone here, or just let me know if I can bring it.
And please join me in the unison words of offering in your service uh, schedule today. The generosity of our gifts of time and financial offerings sustains the work of the Universalist Unitarian Church of Farmington that seeks answers everywhere, includes everyone, and lives with compassion. Representative Women, Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell, by Ingle B. Scott. Women never have been and never will be debarred from practicing medicine. It is so natural to them and so irresistible while they live in families and have the charge of the sick. The best informed and most rational physicians have always seen, and the most courageous of them have always said, from that day to this, that the only cure is in making physicians of some well-qualified women who alone can convince their sex of the seriousness of medical practice and the infinite mischief of meddling with the delicate organization of the human frame without all the knowledge that can be obtained of the structure and action of its various parts. The time has arrived for this reform to begin, as my sketch of Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell will show. The United States is, however, before all other countries in the improvement so universally needed. In all the large towns, there are now female physicians established in good practice after undergoing the best professional training that society affords. In several of the states, the legislatures vote an annual grant for the support of female medical schools and hospitals. Nowhere, perhaps, is such a reform more needed. For many years past, it has been becoming evident that the greatest peril of the American nation lies in the decline of its physical condition and especially in the feeble health of its women. The mortality of children there is beyond all precedent and example. Without going into the causes of this perilous liability, I may just say that the best promise of a remedy lies in the establishment of a class of duly qualified female physicians who can set forth the laws of life with special reference to the education of girls as Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell has done in her work under that title. Such a professional class is established there, and it is she who has done it. The time has arrived for the appearance and action of a, such a woman as Dr. Blackwell, the first woman who ever practiced under a medical diploma. She is the representative of a class now fairly established in the new world and sure to extend over the most civilized portion of the old. The process of emancipation is always the same and it never fails of success sooner or later. Someone or some few cannot forever endure the repression and individual effort bursts the barrier and opens the way for the many to follow. 
It is thus that art and science have been opened to women, never to be closed again. It is thus that every pursuit of which women are capable will in time be at their choice. It is mere loss of time to argue in advance what women can do and what they ought to do. One after another, women will do whatever they are capable of doing. If they will silently prove, like Blackwell, their capacity and their convictions, it is not possible for the whole world to keep them down. Meantime, I do not know that self-respecting and benevolent women can have a better example or encouragement than Elizabeth Blackwell with her silent determination, her indomitable fortitude, and her womanly mind and manners shown in her quiet dress, her gentle demeanor, her steady industry, her devotedness to the suffering, and her lifelong practical testimony to social right and feminine duty. The women of all civilized nations may be thankful for her as the representative of an ever enlarging class. I would like to thank the Sunday Services Committee for the opportunity to speak today. It is indeed an honor. I'd like to especially thank Elizabeth Knight for helping me get pictures and give all the information to the office lady, and Diana for choosing all the music and helping me select a couple of songs. Elizabeth Blackwell was born February 23, 1821, into a politically liberal yet socially conservative independent Congregationalist family in Bristol, England. She was the third of nine surviving children of Samuel and Hannah Blackwell, and Elizabeth developed the love of reading at a young age. Boy, all the people I do talks on learned to read at an early age and loved it. I'm one of the few that didn't learn. <laughs> I, I now know how. In the early 1800s, most girls did not go to school. Society believed that women were not physically or mentally capable of learning the same subjects or doing the same jobs as men. Some thought that an educated woman would be an unfit mother. Elizabeth and her eight brothers and sisters were tutored at home. Their wealthy father believed girls should be educated as well as boys. Elizabeth's father owned a sugar refinery in England. One night, disaster struck. His refinery was burned and completely destroyed. In 1832, when Elizabeth was 11, her family moved to the United States. The nationwide financial panic of 1837 created a panic for them. The family had once hired many servants, enjoyed plenty of food, and had money to spend. Now they faced ruin. Anna took a job teaching in Vermont. Marion and Elizabeth found work as governesses. The future looked bleak. After struggling for years to build a new life for his family, Elizabeth's father died of malaria in 1838. In 1839, Elizabeth rode the wave of Unitarianism that swept over Cincinnati. She was drawn to the church of the newly ordained and installed William Henry Channing, nephew to William Ellery Channing, Unitarian minister. William Henry had a profound and lifelong effect on Elizabeth. Through him, she was drawn to transcendentalism and the writings of Unitarians, Reverend Welf Waldo Emerson, member Hall of Fame for Great Americans, and Unitarian Margaret Fuller, mother of the feminist movement. The sisters opened a small school for girls in Cincinnati, Ohio. Elizabeth disliked teaching, but she wanted to help her family. In 1842, the sisters had to give up the school, which had struggled to make money. The Blackwell family friend, Mary Donaldson, had cancer of the uterus, a particularly difficult disease for women of her generation who had been taught to be ashamed of their anatomy and kept profoundly ignorant of how it worked. 
They were taught to hide their physical selves from men. When these women got so sick that they must seek out medical attention, they were forced to go to male doctors or die unattended. Many of them chose the latter course. Mary said, if I could have been treated by a lady doctor, my worst sufferings would have been spared me. She urged Elizabeth to become a doctor. Elizabeth later decided that being a doctor would be a way to serve others and challenge herself. Elizabeth's friends were shocked at her plan. She was going to study medicine. Her friends told her that no woman has ever been a doctor. Elizabeth's family was a little more supportive. They told her that medical school, two years then, will cost at least $3,000. Where will you get that much money? Elizabeth said, I applied for a job teaching school in Asheville, North Carolina, and I've been hired. I'll save enough money for medical school in two years. Elizabeth contacted Emma Willard for help to go to medical school. Emma had helped women become educated. In 1842, she opened a school, the Middlebury Female Seminary, to provide women with the chance to learn more about science, the arts, classical literature, and philosophy. Later, she moved to Troy, New York, and opened a female seminary. Emma supported a change in the roles women held in society. She believed that women were as intelligent as men and should have the right to an education equal to that given to men. Through Emma, Elizabeth was introduced to Dr. Joseph Warrington, a Quaker doctor practicing in Philadelphia. Elizabeth said, excellent Dr. Warrington has allowed me to visit his patients, attend lectures, and make use of his library. Dr. Warrington is discouraged and joins with his medical brethren in advising me to give up. But for Elizabeth, it was a moral crusade on which she had entered in the light of day and with public sanction in order to accomplish its end. Elizabeth had applied to 28 medical schools and had been rejected by all of them. Dr. Warrington wrote a letter of recommendation for Elizabeth to Geneva Medical School. The facility at Geneva did not want to insult Dr. Warrington by rejecting Elizabeth outright, so they came up with what they thought was a clever idea. They asked the students to vote on Elizabeth's acceptance. If the students voted unanimous, she would be accepted. The students thought it was a joke, so they voted unanimously to accept her, and then Geneva accepted Elizabeth. The following letter was published in the New York Church Union by Stephen Smith, M.D. It happened to me to have witnessed the first instance of the co-education of medical students of both sexes in this country. The first course of medical lectures which I attended was a medical college in the interior of this state in 1847 to 48. The class was composed largely of young men from the neighboring towns. They were rude and boisterous. Some weeks after the course began, the dean appeared before the class with a letter in his hand, which he asked the students to be allowed to read. Anticipation was extreme when he announced that it contained the most extraordinary request which had ever been made to the faculty. The letter was written by a physician of Philadelphia who requested the faculty to admit as a student a lady who was studying medicine in his office. He stated that she had been refused admission by many medical colleges, but he thought this one more likely to be free from prejudice against a woman medical student. The dean stated that the faculty had taken action on the communication and directed him to report their conclusion to the class. The faculty decided to leave the matter in the hands of the class with this understanding that if any single student objected to her admission, a negative reply would be returned. It subsequently appeared that the faculty did not intend to admit her, but wished to escape direct refusal by referring the question to the class, which it was believed would necessarily exclude her. 
A meeting was called for the evening, which was attended by every member. The resolution approving the admission of the lady was sustained by a number of the most extravagant speeches, which were enthusiastically cheered. The vote was finally taken with what seemed to be one unanimous yell, yay. When the negative vote was called, a single voice was heard uttering a timid no. The scene that followed passes description. A general rush was made for the corner of the room which emitted the voice, and the recalcitrant member was only too glad to acknowledge his error and record his vote in the affirmative. <laughs> the faculty received the decision of the class with evident disfavor and returned as answer admitting the lady student. One morning, a lady entered the lecture room with the professor. She was quite small of stature, plainly dressed, appeared diffident and retiring. She had a firm and determined expression. Her entrance into that bedlam of confusion acted like a magic upon every student. Each hurriedly sought his seat, and the most absolute silence prevailed. For the first time, a lecture was given without the slightest interruption, and every word could be heard as distinctly as it would if there had been but a single person in the room. The sudden transformation of this class from rude and boisterous to gentlemen by the mere presence of a lady proved to be permanent in its effects. A more orderly class of medical students was never seen than this, and it continued to be to the close of the term. The townsfolk of Geneva did not accept Elizabeth easily. Women would not even walk on the same side of the street with her. Elizabeth couldn't find living space because apartment managers refused to rent to her, believing in 1847 that only a mad or a bad woman would try to become a doctor. On, on November 7, 1847, Elizabeth entered a medical school classroom for the first time. After many months of hard work, and I didn't put this in here, but most of the time she worked until midnight because she had weeks to make up that she hadn't started at the beginning of the term. After months of hard work, Elizabeth earned the respect of her fellow students. On January 23, 1849, Elizabeth graduated first in her class, becoming the first woman doctor in America. There were 17 students in her class. The male students went up in groups of four to receive their diplomas. Then Elizabeth was called to the stage. She went up alone. As she approached Dr. Hale, he rose, took off his hat, and bowed. Accepting the diploma, Elizabeth said, Sir, I thank you. It shall be the effort of my life to shed honor upon your diploma. The two bowed to each other, and then Elizabeth joined her fellow graduating doctors. Dr. Charles Lee, dean of the medical college, then delivered the valedictory address. He praised Elizabeth for her devotion and hard work. He said that Elizabeth was fully qualified to practice as a physician and that the degree was fully merited. Dr. Lee ended his speech saying, God speed her in her errand of mercy and crown her efforts with success. Loud applause filled the church. But many were not happy with Dr. Blackwell. One doctor wrote, for the honor of humanity, I hope she is the last. Reacting to the general outrage of the medical community, Geneva Medical College immediately shut its doors to women following Elizabeth's graduation. The powers that be declared her a freak whose unnatural example ought not to be followed by other women. Dr. Blackwell's inaugural thesis on typhoid fever published in the Buffalo Medical Journal was the first medical article published by a female student from the United States. After graduation, Elizabeth became a United States citizen. She then went to a maternity hospital in Paris to gain practical experience as no American hospital would train a woman doctor. 
Elizabeth asked Dr. Blott, the head doctor at the hospital, if he knew why so many women came down with fever, some of them dying. The doctor said no, but we are doing autopsies to find out why. Dr. Blackwell said, I will tell you why. The doctors are not washing their hands before examining the patients. Dr. Blott said, we don't have time for that. Finally, when the doctors gave in, fevers and deaths went down. In 1851, Elizabeth met Unitarian nurse Florence Nightingale. They spent much time discussing problems dealing with the health of the poor and sanitation in particular. Both Elizabeth and Nightingale knew that many patients died from infections or diseases they caught because of poor sanitation. In 1860, Nightingale set up a school for nursing and helped establish professional nursing standards throughout Great Britain. In recognition of her work in promoting quality health care, Queen Victoria awarded her the Royal Cross in 1883. In 1907, she became the first woman to receive the British Order of Merit. Both women fought prejudice against women in the medical field. Elizabeth later wrote about Nightingale. To her, chiefly, I owe the awakening to the fact that sanitation is the supreme goal of medicine, its foundation and its crown. One day, while washing a baby's infected eye, which was caused by a form of bacterial conjunctivitis caused by the mother's transmission of gonorrhea to the infant during childbirth, some of the liquid splashed into Elizabeth's eye. Doctors tried for three weeks to cure her, but she had to have the infected eye removed. She had a glass eye for the rest of her life. Elizabeth said, I can never be a surgeon, but I am still a doctor. After returning to the U.S., Elizabeth rented an apartment in New York City and hung out her sign, Elizabeth Blackwell, M.D. The other tenants were horrified and all moved out. In April 1861, the Confederate Army fired on Fort Sumter, starting the Civil War. The war quickly expanded to major battles, and with the battles came many wounded. Elizabeth began working for the war effort immediately. She admired what, what Nightingale had done to ease suffering during the Crimean War. Elizabeth decided to use some of Nightingale's ideas to help the North win the Civil War. Elizabeth became one of the major organizers of the Women's Central Relief Association, WCRA. She was chosen to arrange the nurses' training program. The WCRA involved into the U.S. Sanitary Commission and was officially accepted by the War Department at the suggestion of President Abraham Lincoln. The WCRA participated in sanitary fairs. People paid admission to tour exhibits. Visitors could buy the exhibited items at an auction. The first sanitary fair was held in Chicago. It earned $100,000. Philadelphia and New York held fairs. Each raised about a million which purchased everything from bandages to writing paper to socks, whatever wounded soldiers needed. Elizabeth began training women to be nurses at New York's Bellevue Hospital in 1861. She and her committee chose 91 women they believed would make good nurses. The women attended a one-month training program before being sent to Army hospitals. The nurses had to deal with the prejudices of the Army. The Army was grateful for the bandages and other items, but they did not want female nurses. Women who worked in hospitals were considered low class and immoral. The Army needed more nurses, and there weren't enough men available. The government had to set up an official training program. Dorothea Dix was chosen to head up the Sanitary Commission nursing program in 1861. Unitarian Dorothea Dix had worked to reform mental asylums. In the 1800s, patients in mental hospitals were held in cages and chains. 
Dix, with the help of Universalist newspaper editor Horace Greeley, the only publisher to print serious and respectful reports on women's rights events, such as the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848, and with the help also of Horace Mann, Unitarian, founder of the first public schools in the United States, Dix got laws passed to get kinder treatment for mental patients. One day, Elizabeth saw poor women and children huddled in the doorways and alleys. They were dirty and in need of care. She decided to hold a free clinic and teach people how staying clean would help them be healthy. Soon people started to talk about the wonderful new woman doctor in town. The worst care was that given to women. Victorian prudishness banned male physicians from looking at their female patients if they were doing certain exams. Elizabeth provided women with skilled and sensitive care so that they would not choose death or over, over the horrible prospect of being touched or examined by a strange man. Over the years, Elizabeth and her sister Emily, who graduated from Western Reserve University and became a doctor five years after Elizabeth, healed hundreds of people. In time, they had so many female patients, the sisters started their own hospital, the New York Infirmary for Women and Children, which opened on May 12, 1857, the first hospital run by women for women. The money to run the infirmary came from Quaker supporters. Without their help, the infirmary would have closed its doors soon after it opened. In the 1800s, Quakers, the Society of Friends, made up a third of New York City's population. The Quakers held the progressive attitude that women and men should be treated equally. They had women preachers, which was universal at the time. Quakers supported women's voting, property rights, and entry into politics. Because of their strong beliefs in favor of women, many of the New Yorkers who helped were Quakers. The infirmary was endorsed by several prominent male doctors who risked their reputations by encouraging this venture. The infirmary was a success. Within a month, all beds were full and dozens of patients showed up at the outpatient clinic. Women and children who had no money got free medical care. In the first eight months, the infirmary treated 866 patients. In contrast to the prevailing use by doctors of bleeding, leeching, opium, and stomach purging for problems during pregnancy, Elizabeth advocated exercise, nutrition, sunlight, soap and water, fresh air, lighter clothing, and no drugs. Elizabeth's brother, Henry Brown Blackwell, married the prominent American suffragist and anti-slavery reformer, Unitarian Lucy Stone. She was the first woman to keep her name, her own name, when she married in 1855. Lucy helped form the American Equal Rights Association, and she and Henry also helped founded the American Women's Suffrage Association. The next year, Elizabeth moved back to England. She became the first woman recognized on the British Medical Registry, which allowed her to practice there. Although Elizabeth and her sister were the objects of much ill will in the United States, she was regarded as something of a heroine in London. A poetic tribute in Punch, a British humorous magazine, had this as the first of its seven stanzas. Young ladies all of every clime, especially of Britain, who wholly occupy your time in novels or in knitting, whose highest skill is but to play, sing, dance, or French to clack well, reflect on the example, pray, of excellent Miss Blackwell. <laughs> Elizabeth helped organize the London School of Medicine for Women. In 1871, she helped start the National Health Society, which focused on educating people about health, hygiene, and the prevention of disease. 
In 1875, Elizabeth accepted the chair of gynecology at the London School of Medicine for Women. After one year, her ill health, Billary Colic, forced her to retire. She was a prolific author on health and social topics and continued writing in her retirement. Her works included Medicine and Morality, 1881, Purchase of Women, The Great Economic Blunder, 1887, and The Influence of Women in the Profession of Medicine, 1890. At the age of 74, in 1895, she published her autobiography, Pioneer Work in Opening the Medical Profession to Women. In Elizabeth's last years, she saw the ranks of women doctors swell despite the ongoing efforts of the medical establishment to exclude them. Throughout the late 1800s, male physicians were still making speeches about how it was their professional duty to redeem women from the bondage of her education and restore her to wifehood and motherhood and to uplift the sexual conscience of the community and to fill our homes with prattling children. Elizabeth never married, but she did adopt a girl. Her name was Kitty Berry, a seven-year-old American orphan. Berry remained a devoted daughter, always living with Elizabeth, always calling her doctor, and changing her name to Blackwell after Elizabeth's death. Dr. Blackwell was commemorated on an 18-cent U.S. postage stamp in 1874. Two institutions honor Elizabeth Blackwell as an alumna, Hobart and William Smith Colleges, the current name of Geneva College, founding institution of Geneva Medical College, State University of New York, Sunny, at Syracuse, which acquired Geneva Medical College in 1950 and renamed it the State University of New York, Upstate Medical University, in 1999. Since 1949, the American Medical Women's Association has awarded the Elizabeth Blackwell Medal annually to a female physician. Hobart and William Smith Colleges awards an annual Elizabeth Blackwell Award to women who have demonstrated outstanding service to humankind. Until her death, May 31, 1910, at age 89, Dr. Blackwell was a strong advocate for women in medicine, spending much of her time campaigning for women's rights and establishing institutions dedicated to training female medical students in both the United States and England. Dr. Blackwell's obituary in the London Times read in part, she was in the fullest sense of the word a pioneer who like all pioneers when discouraged heard but did not listen. In 1973, Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell was inducted into the U.S. National Women's Hall of Fame. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, please rise as you are willing and able to join us in our hymn number 21, For the Beauty of the Earth in the Blue Hymnal.
And Paul has our closing words for today. When the medical college at John Hopkins University opened in 1893, it was co-educational. This fact represented a triumph won by a small group of women's rights advocates who also happened to be the organizers of Bryn Mawr College, M. Carey Thomas, Mary Garrett, Elizabeth King, and Mary Gwynn. When John Hopkins announced that it wished to open a medical school but lacked the money to do so, these women raised $100,000 and offered it to the university with the proviso that women be permitted to study medicine. The administrators and trustees did not like this idea any more than had their forebearers at Geneva Medical College. And just like them, they invented a foolproof way out they promised to accede to the donor's wishes if the enormous sum of $500,000 could be raised. Their scheme, like the Geneva scheme, backfired. When a national campaign raised only $200,000, one of the four women, Mary Garrett, contributed $300,000 of her own money. The agreed upon sum was met, the trustees had made a bargain, Women students were thus admitted to the John Hopkins Medical School. Finally, this from the New England Journal of Medicine. One can only hope that excellent Elizabeth Blackwell, MD, will garner the renown she has always deserved. May it be so.